I'm going to dive now into a topic that is uh, pretty close to my heart, which is uh, Russian cyber capabilities. Uh, Russia has been using uh, hacking for political purposes for quite some time. Um, a lot of people uh, are just now becoming attuned to this, uh, especially in the United States, which is relatively um, less involved with uh, Russian foreign policy to a degree. You know, United States citizens often don't feel the effects of uh, the policies of the Russian Federation uh, as acutely as those of us from Eastern European countries and, the, uh, and even Western European countries or, uh, you know, the Caucasus or uh, Central Asia for that matter. But uh, it's clearly um, with this most recent uh, influence operation uh, hitting the heart of America as well. I would say uh, and have been saying for some time to strike at the heart of American democracy. And if any of you guys open up your news apps right now, I'd be highly surprised if this wasn't at the top of your list, right? But it wasn't always the case. When I started analyzing Russian cyber capabilities when I left the Estonian Foreign Ministry about a year and a half ago, these guys were still very secretive. Very few uh, companies were willing to come out with reports. Um, this was the domain of uh, intelligence agencies that rarely published about this. Uh, it certainly wasn't at the heart of political discourse. So uh, that just goes to show, in my opinion, how much cybersecurity has become a central aspect, not just of our uh, companies' business models, um, but also, I would say, our politics at the international level. But diving into it, so uh, a number of APTs or threat actors or however you want to call them uh, that I consider to be, uh, in, in my personal analysis, related to Russia and Russian strategic interests. Uh, one called uh, Snake, the APT 28 and 29 that we'll talk about in greater depth in a little bit, uh, but also several other ones that have attacked uh, a variety of different sectors over the course of the years. Um, it's, it's important to know that uh, Russia is planning to formalize these capabilities into a cyber command, in, uh, which is supposed to reach full operational capability in 2017 as well. So, uh, this is not the first time that threat actors with connections to Russia have uh, engaged in uh, cyber attacks and influence operations against an election. So it might seem new, it might seem novel, but uh, a lot of times in my experience and in my research, what I've seen is that Russian, uh, Russian cyber threat actors practice their capabilities on uh, less daunting foes uh, before they attack uh, Western countries, uh, including the United States of America. So uh, in 2014 in Ukraine, cyber threat actors uh, with connections to Russia uh, attacked the uh, 2014 uh, Ukrainian presidential election, threefold attack. Uh, I spoke a little bit about this last time. Uh, they tried to pretend like it was a hacktivist group uh, by the name of Cyber Bagheera uh, The security community is relatively unanimous in saying that this is a front uh, for uh, essentially Russian state-sponsored groups. Um, they conducted a, a very complicated operation, including DDoS attacks, uh, uh, attempting to change the vote tallies, uh, and uh, interestingly, I think one of the, one of the um, most telling bits and pieces of this particular attack was the fact that uh, there was a Russian state media channel, uh, Rossiya One, uh, that ran, uh, right after uh, the elections closed, ran the exact tally that that virus was intended to uh, project as the official result. So here you get a view into how um, these various parts of the operation come together, uh, disinformation by state propaganda arms combined with cyber attacks, uh, and that'll, be, uh, that'll feature heavily in the DNC case as well. So, uh, this particular case, the juice, uh, juicy part of you know, uh, the presentation today, and why I assume all of you are here, uh, is really the case of Russian election hacking. So, uh, I have it in front of you here. Um, many of you uh, might have been following it from the beginning, others might have only started picking up halfway through this timeline or later, um, but uh, I would say the operation started in 2015, in the summer of 2015. Uh, with the first intrusion into the DNC network by Cozy Bear, uh, and uh, has culminated now in uh, last Friday's report by uh, three in American intelligence agencies depicting their conclusions about um, what exactly happened. Let's dive deeper into it. 
So, you guys remember the cyber kill chain that we talked about before. Let's apply it to this particular case. Um, the seven phases you have on the left, uh, reconnaissance, weaponization, and so on, um, it's safe to assume based on what we know about uh, Russian cyber threat actors' activities and their alleged uh, connections to Russian intelligence agencies that their reconnaissance is uh, extensive, targeted, and based on political priorities. We know from previous targeting exercises that, or analyses that, um, that these targets include uh, countries around Russia's perimeter, also domestic dissidents. Uh, they include ministries of foreign affairs, ministries of defense, the, uh, the European and largely global equivalents of what you have in the U.S. as the Department of Defense and Department of State. Um, and so we know that they do uh, extensive reconnaissance, right? Uh, weaponization is also a little bit tricky. We'll get to it. Um, but they have uh, adjusted their tactics over the course of uh, the last decade in a variety of cases uh, to avoid capture, especially based on uh, or right after security companies have come up with major reports about him. Uh, but uh, in both cases, uh, APT-29 and APT-28, uh, when they attacked the DNC, and the DNC was just one of the targets in their campaigns, they used spear phishing. Um, uh, in the case of APT-29, we know from the CrowdStrike report and from the U.S. government report that the spear phishing emails had links to something called a malicious dropper. It's just a little program uh, that essentially reaches out and uh, um, installs more complicated, uh, more uh, capable uh, malware programs onto your network. So uh, in the installation phase, we see uh, something that uh, CrowdStrike refers to as uh, the C-Daddy implant, uh, also a PowerShell backdoor um, that uh, was then used to execute remote commands in the system. Uh, in the command and control phase, the PowerShell commands uh, opened up an encrypted um, command and control connection, downloaded additional tools. Uh, at this point, the adversaries really own the network. They can do basically anything they want on it. They try to uh, hide their tracks, but this is, uh, you know, file transmission, key logging, uh, and, you know, seeing whatever they want to see, basically. Uh, the final part, actions on objectives, which is really the, the main point of uh, what they were hoping to achieve. Uh, establish persistence, maintain access to the network for months, a year in some cases. Uh, you know, understand more about the network, enumerate their Active Directory accounts. Uh, also move around the network, so they use the uh, Mimikatz uh, based on PowerShell for uh, credential acquisition and lateral movement inside, uh, inside the network, and ultimately, you know, got to the critical assets of the DNC, which is the data that they had on their servers, including uh, all of the information that was useful to the political campaign and that was later disclosed. Uh, similarly, in the case of uh, APT28, um, these guys attacked uh, attacked the DNC in uh, the spring of 2016. Uh, interestingly, uh, according to uh, CrowdStrike's analysis, uh, neither agency knew uh, that the other one was there, which is pretty interesting. Uh, usually, uh, Western intelligence agencies um, who, are, who are cooperating with each other don't target uh, the same organizations for fear of alerting, uh, alerting the defenders to their presence. Uh, this, uh, the fact that two uh, Russian cyber threat actors were in the same organization at the same time is telling about uh, the nature of Russian intelligence agencies, um, their political conflicts, domestic disputes, and uh, I would say is an important part of the analysis here. But uh, in terms of the tradecraft, so they went into, uh, you know, obviously reconnaissance, same thing. They have extensive resources, extensive funding to uh, and also a history of uh, successful attacks that they can use for reconnaissance. Uh, weaponization, same thing. Uh, delivery, in this case, again, is spear phishing with a uh, weaponized document, uh, as well as uh, linked to a um, spoofed uh, email page, in this case, with, uh, with the Podesta emails. Uh, exploitation, uh, in one part of the attack, document had uh, an exploit. Uh, in the other case, the uh, victim gave legitimate credentials uh, willingly, uh, unwittingly, but willingly to the attacker. Uh, so 
uh, after that, uh, after you know the network is uh, exploited, they install uh, various kinds of programs, X-Agent malware, X-Tunnel <laughs> network tunneling tool, and so on. Uh, then you know through these uh, through these tools, they're able to uh, communicate, execute commands on the network. Um, and we do know uh, from the reports that some of these uh, command and control IP addresses um, are known about this particular adversary. Uh, what they did on the network when they ultimately got there is they took a number of anti-forensics measures, cleared logs, uh, reset timestamps. Uh, the malware itself is also has a lot of anti-forensics capabilities, including uh, resisting analysis in virtual machines and so on. And ultimately, they got what they wanted, exfiltrated data, as we know. So. Um, the analysis of competing hypotheses, I think, is, uh, is an interesting one to bring up in this particular case. Um, a lot of you guys have probably seen uh, your president-elect on uh, national television uh, saying uh, quite a few different hypotheses about what might have happened in this case. It could have been Ru Russia, it could have been China, it could have been a 400-pound man in his bed, and so on, right? So, uh, we can consider these to be competing hypotheses and then analyze them. Uh, so, one of the theories is that they were Russian government-sponsored actors, right? Uh, another one is essentially that uh, this was a, an extremely sophisticated deception operation, a so-called false flag attack. And a third one um, is that this was uh, the activities of an independent hacker activist. I won't comment on whether Gucci for 2.0 wears, uh, you know, pajamas and weighs 400 pounds or not. Uh, most likely the, you know, Russian intelligence officers weren't wearing pajamas at the time. Uh, so we can, uh, we can analyze the evidence for these different hypotheses, right? Uh, I've gone through um, a good amount of the technical evidence for uh, thinking that these are Russian government-sponsored hackers. Um, what the analysis of competing hypotheses is good for uh, is essentially ruling out other hypotheses, right? So in the case of a false flag attack, it would be extremely difficult uh, to fake this. Um, the, uh, the attackers would need to attain possession of uh, tools that are used by one of the most sophisticated adversaries uh, out there in the big bad internet. Uh, they would need to compromise their known command and control infrastructure, all of these other uh, websites that they use for their uh, attacks, uh, without this, comp this uh, advanced adversary you know, knowing it. Uh, they would have to emulate, uh, to an extreme degree, the tactics, techniques, and procedures of this particular adversary. And then they would have to uh, have all of that withstand the scrutiny and analysis of not just the target uh, and the intelligence agencies and uh, independent security researchers that have looked at it, but also presumably, you know, that actor who's, uh, who they're trying to fake. So, uh, in short, this is extremely difficult. Uh, and in fact, there is no public record of any nation state ever successfully pulling this off against another nation state. Um, as far as we know, perhaps there is some classified information out there that says this is the case, but, um, but uh, it's not known to me. Uh, so the third theory, uh, and, and so the, the difficulty of this uh, is a strong argument, analysts would say, against the fact that this was a false flag attack. Uh, of course, nothing is impossible, right? And maybe there is some super adversary out there that is just way beyond the uh, understanding and capabilities of anything that we have ever seen as a multi-thousand person security community, but uh, that is uh, unlikely, right? Um, and uh, finally, there's the theory uh, about this little puppet called Gucci for 2.0, uh, who uh, one day after the story broke and CrowdStrike wrote a blog post about it and uh, the Washington Post went public with it, uh, all of a sudden popped up in the blogosphere, opened up a WordPress site, opened up a Twitter site, and claimed to be the mystical hacker that uh, breached the DNC. So uh, really, reporters and security analysts have gone to town with this particular theory. Uh, he claimed to be Romanian. The original Guccifer was a hacker that uh, broke into the websites of, uh, gained access illegally to the websites of uh, a number of um, 
high level figures in the United States government. He was caught, he went to jail. So this guy is pretending to be Gucci for 2.0, another Romanian uh, uh, hacker, hacktivist, right? So uh, he started talking to media reporters, uh, which, which immediately opened him up to uh, scrutiny. Uh, he clearly was not very good at the Romanian language. He, he claimed to be Romanian, but clearly wasn't a native speaker according to linguistic analysis. Uh, the tools and techniques that he claimed to use were actually impossible. He tried to, he said he uh, exploited a bug uh, that in summer of 2015 that didn't actually come around until December 2015. Uh, he also uh, deviated from uh, how hacktivists usually act. Uh, so he claimed uh, right after the story broke that uh, he'd been uh, sitting on this information for over a year. It's extremely atypical. Hacktivists uh, in general uh, are very quick to rush to claim credit for any small attacks that they can conduct, any success that they have in order to inspire others, in order to, um, to boost their reputation online and so on. So uh, this is extremely uh, rare for a hacktivist to sit on something for any extended period of time. Um, so uh, the analysis of competing hypotheses and analytical method takes a little bit of brain power and a little bit of effort, but uh, with this research, uh, it's easy to rule out some of these competing hypotheses uh, and focus on what are uh, the most uh, salient and important ones, uh, those being essentially the fact that this is who we think it is. If it, uh, you know, if it barks like a dog and you know, runs like a dog, then it probably is a dog. Um, I put a little question mark up there if uh, some of you guys have other competing hypotheses that we can uh, discuss in the Q&A session, I'm happy to do that as well. So, uh, but the plot thickens a little bit more uh, before we get done with this presentation. Uh, the United States government, uh, because of the political impact of uh, this particular case, the United States government released a report. Um, because Russia is a nuclear power with uh, uh, an unpredictable leadership and uh, clearly adversarial attitude to the United States. It's, uh, this is a very politically charged topic and uh, uh, the United States government, uh, I assume, felt pressured to release more information to network defenders and release more information to the public about what they thought about this, especially in light of a very prominent pres president-elect um, skepticism. So. Uh, they released a report, um, I believe December 29th, uh, called the Grizzly Step. Um, so it was meant to, uh, not to prove attribution to Russia, but really to help network defenders describe these operations that, uh, that I discussed before. Uh, listed a bunch of names associated with Russian intelligence services, uh, and it provided some indicators of compromise, IP addresses, ER signatures, and so on. Uh, but the meat of it was really, the bulk of it was suggestions and best practices. Uh, it had a lot of information about DHS programs, and it was also pushed out with these uh, sort of technical files full of IOCs, uh, indicators of compromise, so uh, IP addresses, file hashes, and signatures. Uh, immediately after this came out, um, you know, I talked about this super adversary. A lot of people seem to think that uh, intelligence agencies have these magical capabilities and they just snap their fingers and they're into any network and so on. Um, you would think also that their public products uh, would be top notch, top of the line and so on. Immediately after uh, this was released, there was uh, substantial criticism from the uh, cybersecurity community. Uh, I discussed earlier the, uh, the characteristics of um, threat intelligence um, and, uh, and how it's useful, right? So remember that stuff about uh, relevant, timely, and accurate? Um, this was clearly not the case with the Grizzly Step Report. It pushed out a whole bunch of uh, technical indicators without providing any context, uh, and it led to uh, a lot of network defenders around the country uh, feeding these indicators through their technology and really just wasting a whole bunch of time because there's, uh, there's very little useful information in here. Uh, they didn't give any times uh, or context to any of these IP addresses, uh, so we don't know if it's timely. A lot of them led to false positives. A lot of this stuff was, you know, Yahoo uh, servers and so on. A lot of people wasted their time. Uh, following and jumping down this rabbit hole. Um, 
it was also meant to, uh, to be uh, a useful and powerful report uh, because it was supposed to mix private sector data and newly declassified data. Uh, it was completely unclear which was which, which also led to more confusion, context on these indicators. And then really it had about eight pages of DHS initiatives out of a 13-page report. So uh, those of you who have read vendor reports in the past might sometimes roll their eyes when vendors plug themselves. I think the U.S. government kind of uh, outdid all the vendors in that particular category. Uh, yeah, so uh, that's, uh, that's the brunt of my presentation. Uh, I hope that you guys have uh, learned a little bit more about this field, they're a little bit more interested, understand more about it, uh, and also uh, understand a little bit more about what's going on in the world around you. Um, what countries uh, are using what capabilities to, uh, to do what, essentially. Um, what we've discussed so far are things in the past, um, but I think it's important in threat intelligence and otherwise to think about how this is going to be relevant for the future. So uh, engage in something called strategic foresighting, uh, forecasting, I apologize, uh, in order to think about how future uh, developments um, could play out. Uh, I think based on what we've seen here and based on the last 10 years of evidence, uh, Russia is going to continue to integrate cyber capabilities into their broader foreign security policy. Um, Russia has roughly for the last decade uh, been, how do I put this politely, uh, cracking down on civil liberties at home and trying to uh, essentially upend the liberal democratic order uh, in the rest of the world. Um, Russia uh, domestically, uh, in my assessment, does not respect freedoms of association, freedom of speech, and independent press. Uh, conjures up foreign enemies in order to distract from domestic troubles, including economic troubles, um, and really is uh, using uh, its uh, military and intelligence might in order to um, weaken its neighbors, have more power over them, weaken their societies, weaken their democracies, uh, have more influence over them, and it has integrated cyber capabilities uh, into the tool set that it uses to achieve these ends. Uh, we've had a lot of attacks in Central and Eastern Europe and Western Europe. We're seeing the effects of this particular uh, approach uh, when it comes to something that is critical for American democracy. Uh, and it's fair to think that uh, this has not gotten the um, response that it, in my opinion, deserves. Uh, and Russia has no incentives, essentially, to stop uh, doing what it's doing. Uh, the expulsion of diplomats, the seizure of a few uh, compounds, uh, and uh, sanctioning a foreign intelligence agency, um, while a good step forward uh, in terms of cyber deterrence, is really not going to discourage these guys. Uh, they're all celebrating in the Kremlin, popping champagne, basically because they managed to uh, affect an American election in their favor. Uh, and chances are uh, they're going to keep trying to do the same kind of thing. We have elections coming up in France, uh, in Germany, in the Czech Republic um, this upcoming year. Uh, Britain has already warned about uh, attempts by these same adversaries to affect their public life, their elections, their democracy. Uh, so it's, uh, uh, it's fair to uh, assume that this is going to continue happening. Uh, furthermore, uh, Russia has been doing uh, what is arguably uh, as dangerous, if not more dangerous, which is conducting attacks on critical infrastructure. Um, we can get into in the discussion, if you guys want, this whole case about Burlington Electric, but uh, uh, researchers think that in the last year, Russia has conducted two attacks against the energy grid, in, uh, successful attacks against the energy grid in Ukraine, uh, presumably using it as a test bed for attacks around the world. Uh, it's known, uh, reported by news agencies, that uh, Russia is devoting increasing amounts of money to the development of capabilities to attack critical infrastructure, including uh, energy grids, financial infrastructure, financial markets, um, and military command and control systems. So, uh, also, uh, being that uh, this is a, uh, an advanced adversary, um, that uh, is presumably uh, controlled or sponsored by uh, a nation state. 
uh, it's important to understand that what happens in the world will continue to have more of an impact on what they do uh, in the cyber domain as well. So geopolitical analysis, uh, new stories that's going on in the world will continue to affect uh, how these guys behave and what they do and uh, uh, companies and countries need to be aware of and uh, prepare for that. So that's the end of my presentation.